Time to talk about another music-based film. I haven't done that in... a while. But this time, instead of talking about Airheads, a film I watched as a dumb little child, I'm going to talk about a movie I actually remember coming out and getting hyped for. In 2010, so I was still a dumb little kid. Just a slightly older dumb little kid. And that movie was The Runaways. I remember seeing a trailer for it one day while I was getting ready for school one morning, and I was incredibly excited even though I wasn't very aware of this band at the time. I mean, if you just showed me a guitar at age 11, I was sure to be impressed. I didn't see it in theaters when it came out, due to being too young and too poor at the time. I guess the rest of the population had that problem as well. But when it came out, my dad bought it on DVD, and me, my dad, and my sister really loved it. It encapsulated the rock and roll dream for me as a young kid, first learning about power chords, and it was kind of inspiring. I can only imagine how much more it motivated a ton of young girls who watched it. Probably not too dissimilar to when The Runaways first burst onto the scene in the 70s. But as I've gotten older, I've listened to the albums and done my research into the band and their history, and I've realized how the band's trajectory and history history really differ from the movie. Now, I'm aware that films about real-life events have to be dramatized and changed for the big screen. One of my favorite films of all time is Men Not Express, and that movie also changed a lot of what actually happened. But I can agree with most of the changes, and they actively improved with the film. But in the case of The Runaways, I smell a lot of revisionist history. The movie feels incredibly biased towards Joan Jett, who served as the executive producer and was heavily involved in the production. Hmm. But before I go into some of the problems I have with this flick, I'll touch on some of the positives this movie has, and there's quite a few. First off, we have pretty much all of the performances. Then 16-year-old Dakota Fanning played Cherie Curry, and she fit the part pretty well, if for no other reason than she was a comparable age to what Cherie was during the band's heyday. So she has a sense of naivete in her performance, which wasn't too far off from reality. Though it does make the scenes where she's wearing skimpy outfits much harder to watch after knowing the fact. Kristen Stewart's Joan Jett encapsulates her attitude quite well, though it feels like a version of herself that's slightly sanitized. She doesn't seem to have the same chip on her shoulder that you can tell Joan really had back in the day. But I'd honestly attribute that more to the script than Kristen's performance. And it's fine enough, so I can't really complain. But Michael Shannon absolutely crushes it as Kim Fowley. He steals every scene he's in, he's very eccentric with a ton of memorable lines. Now, you dogs need to get dirty because all those little fuck boys out there are wearing dresses and leaving their, their lipstick on each other's cocks, okay? Now, I want to hear you fuck girls growl. If I'm training a wild dog and it bites me in the hand, then I know I've trained it well. My hand is made of iron. Rock and roll is a blood sport. It is a sport of men. It is for the people in the dark, the death cats, the masturbators, the outcasts who have no voice, no way of saying, hey, I hate the fucking world. My father's a faggot. Fuck you. Fuck authority. I want an orgasm. And he's just a guy you love to hate. A classic villain that you don't really see in biopics too much. And even though he was very much vilified in the film, rightfully so, the movie still makes it clear how important he was to the band's formation, success, image, damn near everything that defined the band. Though this film definitely glosses over many of the objectively terrible things he did to these young girls. Don't worry, we'll touch on more of that later. The coming of age angle is an interesting idea to go with for a biopic. It doesn't feel too out of place since the band this film was based on was largely made up of troublemaking teenagers growing into themselves. Though in the end, I think this does more harm than good. Again, we'll come back to this. The soundtrack and the songs used in the film are of course stellar. Obviously, we have a good helping of Runaways classics, including the very underrated I Wanna Be Where The Boys Are. It's used quite a bit, which is good to see since most biopics would ignore a song this obscure. Some are re-recorded with Dakota Fanning and Kristen Stewart doing lead vocals, and they're not bad. There's also choice cuts from Susie Quattro, The MC5, Bowie, Nick Gilder, and Don McLean that also fit the movie very well. In fact, this movie even has some nice reincorporation with the Don McLean hits Vincent, which took me by surprise when re-watching. Also, Roxy Roller is a great choice to open the film, soundtracking Cherie's first period, which reinforces the fact that she's just a kid at the very start of the story, before anything happens to her. I also like the rebellious feel of the film. Last time I watched it, I thought it was a bit exaggerated with things like Joan's guitar teacher telling her, Girls don't play electric guitars. 
It just seemed too cartoony until I found out that this was 100% real and it really puts into perspective the sexism the girls in the band had to deal with throughout their entire career and how it drove them to do what they did. Also I appreciate the gayness that existed within certain members of this band wasn't glossed over too much. You can tell it was held back, but I'm glad that it's at least represented since it's a kind of thing that would have usually been cut in a major motion picture like this, especially in 2010 when people's acceptance of the gay community wasn't as good as it is today, so I'm glad it was included since it also existed as character development for Joan and Cherie. In fact, I remember a few years ago, Lita Ford said that she almost quit the band at first because she was a sheltered kid who had never even seen a gay person before joining the band, and she didn't know what to make of it at first. And speaking of Lita, time to get into some of the negatives. Jesus Christ, they make Lita out to be the biggest bitch. Now from what I can tell, Lita isn't exactly the nicest person ever, but there's not a single scene of her in this movie where she isn't being anything less than a passive aggressive cunt. I'm sure she had her moments, but when Medusa is a more likable character in comparison, you know you went a bit overboard. And the performance by Scott Taylor Compton is not helping at all. She's chewing the scenery in every shot, and she's portrayed as being way too unlikable to be believable. Fowley says handling Cherie's ego is like having a dog urinate in your face. The best thing that could happen to this band would be if Cherie hung herself from a shower rod and put herself in the tradition of Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> Shit, man. That's great. That's fucking right. Bruh. I have a feeling this is because of Joan's involvement, since Joan and Lita famously do not like each other at all, and their strained relationship is why there never was, and there likely will never be, a Runaways reunion in any sort, even for a one-off performance. And since Joan was by far the most involved in the film's production, she served as the historical advisor of the project, which is a major problem since she clearly still has a huge grudge against Lita, even all these years later. And I'm not saying that Lita was an angel, I'm sure she had her fair share of issues, but it's a bit low to depict her in such a way when she's not even there to defend herself. And what about the other members? While Stella Reeves, Sandy West has a vocabulary of almost exclusively adjectives. These guys are talking about going to film party on the south side, it's supposed to be bitchin'. You wanna go? Bitchin'. And even though she's the first person to jam with Joan and the second member of the band, she's relegated to the back as quickly as she's introduced. And Jackie Fox? She straight up is nowhere to be found. In her place is a stand-in for her with a character named Robin Robbins. I wish I was kidding. You see, after leaving the Runaways in 1977, Jackie went to Harvard School of Law and became an in-demand attorney in the entertainment industry. And from what I can tell, when she heard there was going to be a Runaways film, she wanted to see a script for herself, since, you know, it was a big part of her life, so you could definitely understand why she would want to see how she was portrayed. But they refused to let her see it, so she didn't allow her use of the name of the film. Now, I could be wrong, as the information about this topic is really murky and hard to find, but if this is true, damn, that is disheartening. And unfortunately, it only gets worse from here. I'm sorry, but we kind of need to get into this. In 1975, after being given quaaludes by who she thought was a roadie at a party, Jackie became incapacitated and was then raped by Kim Fowley in full view of all the partygoers, including Cherie and Joan, though both of them have denied being present at this horrifying event, even though there are many other people who affirmed this event happening, and Jackie did not blame them for not doing anything in this situation. They were just kids after all. Vicky Blue, the person who replaced her on base in 77, had this to say. All of us in the Runaways have always been very aware of this ugly event. I don't see it as a witch hunt or a criminal accusation or a blame game. This is one rape victim's personal story of how she's beginning to come to terms with what happened to her so many years ago, while also trying to let the others, who are innocent bystanders, know that she has never held them responsible in any way. I encourage my former bandmates to exercise compassion and understanding here, and to not shift the paradigm and spin this any other way. Maureen Herman, former bass player of the band Babes in Toyland, wrote a really good article about this subject back when Jackie first came out about her ordeal. And I would recommend giving it a good read because she goes into much more detail than I can in this video. There will be a link in the description. And yes, I know, Jackie only came out with this information publicly about five years after the film's release, but Vicky said that everyone in the band was always aware of what happened. Was there sexual abuse to the band? To Kim Fowley? 
I'm not the person to ask. So, if you don't think this has something to do with a lack of Jackie in the film, then I don't know what to tell you. And the cardboard cutout they have of Jackie in the film, for one, has a stupid fucking name. Come on, Robin Robbins, were you even trying? And she only has like three lines. How does the fucking roadie have more lines than one of the founding members? All she does is stand there and occasionally look sad. That's it. And using Jackie's story in the film would have been a good excuse for character development for everyone in the movie. Especially the other runaways, besides Joan and Cherie, who have been pushed to the side. Yes, this is supposed to focus on those two people, I'm aware, but the movie is called The Runaways, so that implies that the film should focus on more than just two members. And even if they couldn't use Jackie's name or likeness, why not use Vicky Blue instead? Even though she didn't join until much later, and it wouldn't have made much sense for those who know this band's history, at least she was actually in the band, and a real person, not just a stock insert character. Oh wait, they couldn't have used Vicky Blue, because God forbid we acknowledge the fact that the Runaways existed after Cherie left. I know the original lineup is obviously the much more well-known and recognizable version of the band than the one fronted by Joan, but this isn't like the Doors movie glossing over the fact that the Doors existed well after Jim died. Cherie was only in the band for about half the time they were active, and was on two out of four albums. And the Joan Sang albums have their fair share of classic songs like Wasted, School Days, and Black Leather. So it's not like no one cares about those albums. Hell, School Days isn't even on this film's soundtrack. As mentioned before, I know this film is supposed to focus on Joan and Cherie's relationship, but they still could have done that while showing that vital part of the band's history. They could have showed the two of them reeling from the breakup of the band by cutting back and forth from the Runaways recording Waiting for the Night, while Cherie was recording Beauty's Only Skin Deep, or touched on her film career, and more of the beginnings of Joan Jett and the Blackhearts formation. I know you can only cram so much into a 90 minute feature, but then why not cut most of the scenes involving Cherie's sister and her family life? It honestly doesn't add much, and you can cut it to a minimum, and the viewer wouldn't really miss much. So why not fill that time with something more engaging? And in maybe the worst case of this band's history being messed with, Carrie Chrome and all mentions of her were completely taken out of the film, even though she was the one with the initial idea to form an all-female rock band, and was the one who introduced Kim to Joan. Whereas in the film, you're made to believe that Joan was the one who introduced herself to Kim, and was the one to have that idea. No guys, I, I want to start an all-girl rock band. And Carrie also co-wrote a bunch of the band's songs, including Secrets, California Paradise, and Waiting for the Night. She didn't end up in the band due to Kim sidestepping her for other musicians, and later claiming all the credits. The reasoning for her being tossed aside are still a bit murky, but regardless, another vital part of this band's history is completely non-existence. If it wasn't for Carrie, you wouldn't be watching this video right now. Simple as that. By the end of the movie, it just feels like a Joan Jett puff piece. It feels like more of a puff piece than her own documentary does. Yeah, I know Joan had by far the biggest career post The Runaways, but it's not like no one else in the band did anything else. Lita had her fair share of success too. She had a platinum record and a hit duet with Ozzy Osbourne, but she doesn't even get a write-up at the end of the film. Christ, guys, at least make your bias at least slightly subtle. This, once again, is the problem of only having one person who is actually there as a creative consultant. I know they supposedly based this film off Cherie's book, but even she says that this film barely has anything to do with her book. I guess history really is written by the victor. If you want a better understanding of what actually happens in this band's history, I would recommend the documentary Edge Play that Vicky Blue directed in 2004. It includes just about everyone in this band's history to have their say in what happened, and it feels more genuine than the biopic that later came. Don't get me wrong, there's also a lot of problems with Edge Play. It goes on a little too long, it kinda drags, and there's a lot of bitching from each of the band members, I'd venture to say too much. I think it would've worked way better if it included the girls maybe hashing out their differences with each other, instead of whining about each other behind the other girls' backs. Also, there's not much actual Runaways music since Joan refused to appear and refused to license any of the songs she wrote. She said she didn't want to appear in a Jerry Springer fest, and what actually happened was different than what was in the film. Which is a fair complaint? But in that case, why not work with Vicky and make it better instead of whining about it later on? And then later spearheading a film that was a gross mischaracterization of the band's history. Obviously, I wasn't there, but I'd wager to bet that Edge Play is a far more accurate account of what actually happened. 
since they bother to talk to more than just one person. Overall, it's not a bad film. It's actually quite entertaining, and you can get a lot out of it. But don't walk away from this film thinking you have a perfect idea of the band's dynamic and history, because that's just not the case. The director said this wasn't a biopic, it was more of a coming-of-age film. Well, why not make both? It's not as if those genres are mutually exclusive, and if you had to twist the truth in such a way in order to focus on Joan and Cherie, then why even bother? You could easily write your own script and keep many of the same themes of feminism, friendship, and music without having to use the runaway's name. At least Lords of Chaos admitted it was based on truth and lies. But that's just my opinion. Tell me what you think below in the comments. And click right here for more videos. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell to remain notified and support the channel. But anyways, take it easy party people.